Christmas without Christ has no focus. And so if we keep Christ in Christmas, we know what Christmas truly means. So Isaiah 9 and verse number 6 for, says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This scripture reminds us once again of the precious gift we have in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we go into this Christmas season, I hope we do so celebrating the birth of the most precious gift we could have ever received, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. Penny Missions. Who's going to win this morning? Who, Kenneth? He said, the Lord. Amen. Well, the Lord wins. Amen. Uh, amen. So, all right. Come on. If you've got some change you'd like to put it in the offering this morning, come right on. All right. We've already got some new volunteers for the young ladies. Amen. Any other ladies? Come on. Join in. I mean, I, I would sing while they're doing this, but I don't want everybody to leave. I'd have to get Brother Scott to come do a duet with me. Oh, we got more coming. That's it. All right, then. Amen. All right. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. What a blessing. Amen. To see the men, the guys win again. Amen. And so we thank the Lord for that. Hate it that the girls were sick and made it such an easy contest. Amen, but sometimes you just got to take every victory no matter how it comes. Amen. Amen. So, all right, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll be dismissed to our Sunday school classrooms. Uh, Brother Charlie, would you pray for us? Amen. All right. You are dismissed. Good morning, Miss Katie. That was Brian's, actually. And I forgot to pick him up. Mm. <sighs> we need to learn to take the hat off in church. Well, as we're getting settled down, I'd like to say well, something that uh, I enjoy saying this time of year especially. Merry Christmas. I like saying that. You know, we go to Walmart and all those places, 
I'd just like to see if anybody's going to say it back to you. Merry Christmas. See if they can say it back to you. Uh, over Walmart yesterday saying that. Amen. All right, we're going to be, now, we are studying Exodus chapter 23, as you know. But we're going to be in Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23 today as, as, as at least we will begin with anyway. But um, Exodus chapter 23. Um, before we start, anybody got anything on their heart they want to pray about? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my wife and dad is in the Uh oh. So, you know, he keeps, he's okay. He's got some medication for that. It's just, he never feels good. He's just sitting right there. So, we've got to take care of my wife's health. But they get in places where it will continue hurting. <laughs> well, I mean, it's sometimes. Really I pray for Miss Trina, who's got kidney stones. Anybody else? Well, Mary's not feeling good. Mary's not feeling good. Of course, the girl uh, has already been mentioned, uh, Emily. I don't know about Lizzie, but uh, say Emily's not feeling good. Anything else? You want to praise or pray about before we start? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the time we can come to explore the Word of God to be able to get closer to you by knowing you, and that we have our faith can grow by knowing the word of God. And we thank you, Lord, for these things. And we do pray for those who are sick, who's been mentioned this morning already several times. And I pray, Lord, that you'll just be with them and, and help them up and get them back on their feet very quickly. And help us all who will be exposed or are exposed to uh, danger of being sick. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us in through these things. And, and I pray, Lord, you give me clarity this morning and help my mind to be what it should be in the power of the Spirit. And, and I pray, Lord, all we're here. We thank you, Lord, for all that's here this morning. Thank you for so much. And I pray for all that's here and all that can hear on the, uh, over the uh, air. Lord, I pray, Father, that you'll just bless and Speak to our hearts now. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we've been talking about the uh, three uh, times of the children of Israel, or the men of Israel, specifically, the men of Israel has to come back to the place where God has set, which would uh, end up, not at the beginning, but uh, later on in Jerusalem, but at the beginning, it was elsewhere, but or uh, they had to come uh, to the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, that is the Passover, and the uh, Feast of the Harvest, which is uh, also known as Pente Pentecost, and the Feast of Ingatherns. And that feast, the first two feasts is pretty close together. The last feast is at the end of the year, in the fall of the year, and that's the Feast of Ingatherns, or the Tabernacles, or the Booths. Now, uh, we've been talking about those uh, the last couple of weeks. Passover was in the 14th day of Abib. That's the first month of the, of the, the calendar. That the, now, the Jewish people have two calendars, and one of them, the one that we, that's being used in the Bible, is the one that God gave them uh, there when it came out of Egypt. And he set it up, and he said Abib, Abib would be the first month of their year. And so God set this calendar up, but they also have another calendar that the Jewish people go by as well. It's kind of confusing to me. I don't know how, how they can follow two different calendars, but they do. Now, uh, we've been we've talking about all those things last week, and and uh, at the feast of the Passover, uh, they are not to eat anything before you know their feast foods before they have their uh, their slaughter of their lamb. And then they eat all that that night, and they cannot um, they cannot let any of it go beyond that day. It has to all be eaten that night before morning. And um, this is all symbolic, by the way, uh, about Christ. In fact, uh, Colossians chapter two, verse seventeen. I didn't quote this last week, 
I meant to, but I didn't. My Colossians chapter 2, verse 17 uh, says, which, is, which are the shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So it's all above Christ, but it's the shadow of things to come. Now we know that Christ is the fulfillment of all the law. We know that. And uh, a lot of people have spent a lot of time on that. And, but you've heard enough. I'm sure that most of you already know that. And so uh, they, they give their offerings and talk about the second offering that was also made. Um, and that's in the Feast of the Weeks, which is called the Feast of the, uh, Pentecost in the New Testament. Um, uh, it's the Feast of the uh, Harvest in chapter 23, verse 16 in the Exodus which I just read a few minutes ago, but also it's called Feast of the Weeks. And, um, and so 50, uh, Pentecost means 50th, as you know. I hope you know that. It means 50th. It means 50th day after the, uh, after the, uh, the first, um, the, first uh, uh, the first offering, after the first uh, uh, gathering, um, the feast, uh, then 50 days after and seven weeks, the Bible says. In fact, I want you to look at it. We'll read, read some of this. I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to start at. Okay. Uh, verse 10. Verse 10 in Leviticus chapter 23. Verse 10. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye are come into the land which I give you, uh, ye shall reap the harvest thereof. Uh, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest, Unto the priest. Now, this is the very beginning when they first begin to um, seven weeks into their their after they begin to plant their gardens, then they start reaping some things out of it. So they are to bring these things back to the to the place of worship, which would be in Jerusalem uh, in latter times. But um, uh, but that's at the tabernacle and. Um, here, but um, now, if you notice, this is in the, their future. They're in Mount Sinai, as I said last week. They're in the desert, and we know because of the circumstances of their disobedience and unfaithful to God, they ended up in the desert for 40 years. But when they get into the land, which God was going to give them, this is what they are to do when they get into this land. And they bring these first fruits unto, of their harvest to the priest at that time. And, uh, and this is an offering to the Lord. And he shall wave the sheaf uh, before the uh, Lord. And they put a, a, the, the fruits in this sheaf thing, and they wave it around before God. And uh, it will be accessible for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. That will be on Sunday. That will be the first day of the week. That is a picture of pointing towards the, 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 church, the age of church, the time of church that we have today, what we're having to now. And so this is um, pointing towards the future, and they are to wave this on that day. But then the Bible says, um, and ye shall offer that, uh, that day, that same day, on that first day of the week, uh, when ye uh, wave the sheaf of a lamb without... Uh, um, a lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Now, this is the second lamb. The first lamb was at, was at the uh, feast uh, of the Passover at the very beginning. That was the lamb that was to be ate, I mean, uh, the, uh, offered and eaten that very night. Now, this is the second lamb, which I mentioned last week, I believe points again all this points again to the future, points again to the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world, and uh, towards the church. Uh, uh, we are built on, the, on Christ and nothing else. And so um, this all points to this. And they offer a second lamb. And verse 13, uh, the meat offering thereof shall uh, be two tenths of fine flour mingled with oil, um, offering made by the fire, uh, fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. 
Uh, when, when every time it mentions a sweet savor, that's always uh, pointing towards prayer. Pointing to uh, prayer. Well, the, the, the smell that comes up like prayer comes up to God. And the Bible talks, talks about our prayer being a sweet smelling uh, savor. And so, uh, <clears throat> points towards prayer. And I've lost my place again. Oh, I right hear. And uh, we talked about some of this last week. And then the drink offering, we talked about that here in uh, verse 13 and also in verse 18. It was a, uh, now there, there's more I, I like to say about this drink offering, but I'm going to do it later when we get in some more of these offerings. But um, this drink offering right here also points to the fact that they, it was alcoholic. If you go into, into Hebrew, you find out it was an alcoholic beverage. It was fermented. It was fermented wine. And so they poured this out as saying that, that they're giving this over to God. I know many people who got saved gave it all to God. And that's what they should do. I gave my drugs and drinking over to God when I got saved. Oliver B. Green. I don't know how many ever heard his testimony. Oliver B. Green. Now he talks about when... Um, he took his uh, sister to church at a revival meeting. I don't know if it was a revival meeting, maybe, maybe a Sunday night, but it was that night. His father, I think it was a, a revival meeting, if I'm not mistaken. But um, his father, uh, his daddy, made him take her. He didn't want to go. He wanted to borrow the car, take, go out with a girl on a date. He said, before you can do that, you've got to take your sister to church. And, uh, of course, he took her to that church that night. He sit in the back. He listened. He got so angry and upset about it. He didn't want it. He had nothing to do with it. He walked out of church after service and uh, got on conviction so much. He went back in and talked to the pastor got saved. But when he got saved, he went straight back home. He said he had liquor and beer or liquor and, uh, and alcoholic beverages hidden all over his little apartment his it was, it was a little apartment he had right beside his mom and dad's house, and, and they also ran a store at that time, a little country store. And, um, and he had it hidden all over the place. He took it all out and poured it out. He gave it up to God. And so, uh, and also he said he threw his cigarette down that night and got in the, out in the field and prayed and got up, and God had called him to preach. He knew God had called him to preach that very same night he got saved. And so... Uh, that is amazing, but uh, this offering was given to God, poured out before God. They would pour it out either on the ground, and sometimes they would pour it out actually on the offering, I've been told. And they'd pour it out on the offering and, and like, would burn and sizzle on top of the offering, and of the, of the meat offering. But, um, but either way, it was poured out before the Lord, uh, saying that they're giving their life to God, they're given. They're given wholeheartedly to God, and so now, um, then it says in uh, verse fourteen, and you shall eat neither bread nor uh, parched corn. You don't eat anything until after the offering has been taken. Verse fifteen. Here's what I want to get to, and ye shall count your count unto you from tomorrow after the Sabbath. That's, that's on Sunday. From the day that ye brought uh, the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Seven weeks. Seven weeks. Now, uh, seven times te uh, seven is 49. 49. That would be 49 days. Plus the one day, the first day of the week, which is the, uh, the Pentecost always landed on, and was on the first day of the week when the Holy Spirit was given on Pentecost in the book of Acts. And so 49 plus 1 equals 50. It equals 50. And um, then the Bible says, they have been up to this time, they have always, uh, everything God has said, they had to offer God these different things without leaven. No leaven be found in their homes. No living be found in, in their property. No living be found in the camp anywhere at all. That is um, uh, self-rising, whatever you want to call it. But what you put in your biscuits and things. But no living whatsoever should be found anywhere at the time. They had to bury it. They had to put it away. 
until after these feasts, and then they could bring it back out, and the rest of the time they could use it in their foods. But this was a bread of affliction, the Bible calls it. It's a bread that don't, it's not supposed to taste good and be something that you're supposed to really enjoy, but it's supposed to be something to remind you of where you come from, the awful life you've lived, and the sin that God saved you out of. It's something they reflect back to. And so, uh, so there would be no leaven, the bread of uh, affliction. And I keep hearing Christmas music. But, uh, <laughs> all right. Now, so this leaven, and no leaven. But then we get in verse 16, there's going to be a new meat offering, the Bible says. A new kind of offering. A new kind of offering. It says verse 16, even tomorrow after the seventh, that is on Sunday, on the first day of the week, uh, you shall number 50 days, and ye shall offer a new uh, meat offering unto the Lord. There's going to be a new kind of offering, a uh, completely different than what has been taught and been done before. So we're still talking about the even farther in the future here. And so what is this new offering? Two loaf, uh, wave loads in verse uh, 17. You shall bring, you know, shall bring out... Uh, of your inhabitants, two wave loaves of ten, uh, two tenths deal. They shall be a fly, fine flour, and they shall be bacon with leaven. With leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. They are to be bacon, baked with leaven. This speaks of the church in the future. This speaks of the Jews and the Gentiles who come together and worship in the church. Now, there's much in the Bible throughout the scriptures talking about that. Even Jesus, when he was, was uh, in Samaria and that woman came down to the well and he started talking to her, he said uh, there's going to be a time when you don't worship in this place, you don't worship down in Jerusalem, in the temple, but there's going to be a time when you're going to worship him in spirit and in truth. And there's going to be a time that's going to be worshiping together, all together. Uh, so there's going to be a time, and that's, this is what it's speaking of, the first fruits unto the Lord. The Bible says Jesus was our first fruit, and we are his fruits, first fruit as well unto him. And so he speaks of the first fruit. Now, I want you to notice, when we get to this point, now, we're, we're at the time of Pentecost. We're at the time of speaking of the future of the church. Now, if you notice the progression of the more offerings that are being given now, more offerings, the progression of the offerings that are being given now. Now, the Bible says, and ye shall offer with the bread, that is the bread of unleavened bread that's given, I mean, uh, uh, as unleavened bread as well as the uh, leaven bread, both of them, are to be uh, used. And it says, And ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish uh, of the first year, that's a year old lambs, a young bullock, uh, two rams. They shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offerings and with their drink offerings. And uh, even the offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. Um, verse 19, and you shall uh, sacrifice one kid, the, uh, one kid of the goats, that is a, child, uh, that is a young goat, and um, uh, for a sin offering, two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offering. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits, that bread that has the leaven and unleavened mixed together, the different breads here, and for the wave offering before the Lord, and the two lambs, they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. Now, these these offerings are more than what they were before, and more aggressive. Now, if you read uh, and listen to a lot of preachers and read people like J. Vernon McGee and others, every time they talk about these different offerings, uh, all they usually say is that this is about Jesus, this is about Jesus, this is about Jesus, and about every one of them. They don't really explain why would God 
uh, have so many different offerings? And what would be the purpose of so many different offerings? God is not redundant. He's not just going over and over and over the same thing over and over. There, there are purposes in this. First of all, you see here seven lambs. And, of course, the word the number seven, as we know, speaks of perfection. Perfection. And you see seven throughout. Many preachers preached on, on the perfection of God. And throughout the Bible, uh, the seven, however it comes up so many times from Genesis to Revelation. Perfection. Seven lambs of perfection. Pointing to the, the perfect God and the, the perfection and the perfect life that you and I will have in Jesus. So we are, when we are saved and we trust the Lord, he proclaims us what? Righteousness? He proclaims us holy? You say, I don't feel so holy and I don't feel that righteous. Maybe we don't because we, we're still in this old sinful body. But as far as God's concerned, when he looks at us, he don't look at our sin. He looks at Jesus. He looks at what Jesus has done in us and who he is. And so that uh, speaks of perfection. And then the uh, one, one bullock, that's a giant animal, a gigantic animal, like a, a, a cow, cattle. It's mentioned in several places in the Bible, cattle, bulls, or oxes. And uh, so... Uh, the, these giant, gigantic animals, uh, one bullock is also used, and uh, that is to cover much things. And, and then you got two rams. Now, I, I know something about rams. I, you know, a Dodge used a ram head on their trucks. And why would they put a ram head on their trucks? Right there. They used to put them right there in the middle of the hood years ago. And, uh, but uh, the rams. You know, rams, you know, got them big curled uh, horns, and they like to butt heads. They like to fight. They're fighters. They're fighters. And these two rams, uh, are, as our uh, Bible says, are uh, for, uh, is our uh, trespass offerings, is our trespass offerings. Now, we'll get into uh, several places in the Bible about, our tr about trespass offerings, and and you'll see this, uh, that it was the trespass offer. And you know what trespass is? That is when you see a sign and you go past that sign that says do not enter. Now you're trespassing against the will of someone else. And uh, the law that has been set before you, we trespass against God many times. We know that knowing that this is wrong, wrong and this is not right, this is not what the Bible teaches, and we'll still fall for the sin and trespass against God. Trespass offer, not obeying God or either going beyond what he had taught and uh, just trespass against him. And so it, it speaks of the trespassing and the uh, fighters who want to fight and, and, and uh, ram each other and who wants to be the boss. You know, that's why they fight each other, to see who's going to be the number one, to be the head of the clan. And so the, the ram speaks of our trespass offerings. And then it gets to, um, where am I at now? Um, trespass offering then uh, you got uh, you got you got the, uh, the 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 goat here the goat here uh, which is our sin offering Bible makes it very clear here is our sin offering um, a sin offering now the uh, goats uh, some of you raise goats you know what they're like some of them stinks. I mean, they can be stinking goat. And they'll eat anything. You throw anything out there. I had a goat when I was growing up, and my dad would put, would put that goat out there in our fields, and it'll clear that fields out for us. And you throw garbage out there. It'd eat the cans, everything. It'd eat anything it could get its mouth on. They'd eat anything. Goats are just go after anything. So it speaks of our sin offering, just going after anything in this world, that to go, to just follow whatever's out there and, and uh, just swallow anything that's coming at us. And uh, we just swallow up all these lies and deceptions and, and it's our uh, sin offerings. It speaks of our sins. And like sin, they stink. Sin can stink. Uh, it makes a mess of our lives and ruin our lives. Sin offerings. Um, Towards the young bullock, it speaks of strength, being strong, being large and strong. You know, some, a lot of times we have, 
we, we think we're so strong we really don't need to obey God. We don't really need to listen to what God says. We're strong enough. We can handle it. We can obey. I mean, we can do uh, things and, and, and it will not bother us. How many people have felt in lust who uh, said, well, we're strong enough. We can handle those things. I can look at those things. I can, I can uh, listen to that stuff, all right, music. Whatever. And I'm strong enough and it's not going to hurt me spiritually. And it speaks of how our strength in ourselves, we give it to God. Paul spoke of that. He said, when I am weak, then I'm strong. When we get weak to ourselves and we give up and we surrender to God, he says, God, I can't handle these things. God, I cannot uh, be close to you and follow these ways of the world. I'm... I need to humble myself. And then God give us the strength to obey, obey him and overcome these things. Now, so the uh, bullock, these large animals, speak of the strength that we think we have. We can do things our own way, our own strength, but we can't do that, can we? And so we have these things. And the, like I said, the rams are fighters. They're hard-headed. They tr it's a trespass offer. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 15 says, If a soul committeth a trespass sin through ignorance in the, in the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring for his trespass unto the Lord a ram without blemish uh, out of the flocks. You remember Abraham when God had told Abraham to take Isaac up to a mountain, he would show him and sacrifice him unto God. Now, there's a problem here. God, uh, Abraham knew God does not accept human sacrifices. That was not God's way. He knew that. But yet, because he knew God said to do this, he was willing to follow God in that, even though he knew it went against his conscience and against what God had previously said. I thought about, uh, think about, uh, I'm trying to think of his name. Um, I should have wrote it down. Um, uh, Bimlech, is it, no, not Bimlech, is it Bimlech? No. Uh, who was asked for, just says my mind now, who was asked to go and curse the children of Israel? Balaam, yeah, Balaam. It just, started, it just went out of my head right there. Balaam who was cur uh, to ask to curse Israel. And he prayed. He asked God, should I go up? Should I do this? And God said, no, don't go with them. Stay here. He prayed several times over, and God said, no, no, no. Finally, after so many times, him coming back at him, offering him more money, offering him more opportunities, and uh, he just just couldn't handle it anymore. He said, God, please let me go, and, and, and I'll do what you say. Just let me go. He wanted that, he wanted that riches. He wanted the, the finances and all the things that it's going to offer him. But I'll do what you say. And on his way, God knew that his heart wasn't right. God had told him not to go, but then God said, okay, if you want to go, go ahead. Go ahead. But then God was about to kill him, because he was going, because God first told him no. We should listen the first time. We should obey the first time and not keep on until we get what we want. And a lot of people do that. And so with, um, and so he did that, but yet he did finally, after seeing the death angel, finally did what God said, but he went on, he went on went on, but he obeyed what God said at that time. Abraham went on up to the mountain. He told his men, We will come back. Isaac and I will come back. The lad and I will come back. And went up there to sacrifice his animal, and then God I mean his son and God stopped him. But you remember on the way, uh, Isaac asked him, Where is the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb. So God himself was the lamb. He provided it. 
But when he got up there and God stopped him, he looked in the bush. What did he see? Was it a lamb? It was a ram. What was a ram? Speaks of trespass offerings. So he offered a trespass offering, not a sin offering, not an offering for redemption, uh, which the lamb who redeems us, who buys us back, who saves us but a trespass offering because he went against what he knew to begin with God did not allow. But he went against it, but God kept him from going through it, from going all the way through it because he wanted to see just how far he would go. It was a test for Abraham. Now, so it was a, t- a trespass offering that Abraham offered. Now, uh now, the uh, first feast, the Passover, was on the 14th day the, of Abraham. The second feast of the unleavened bread was on the 15th day. But if you notice in Exodus chapter 23, when we first read this, it did not mention the Passover at all. It only mentioned the unleavened bread when they first come, the men are to first come together for these, uh, uh, these uh, offerings. Now, in the... Now, these were offerings to the Lord. These were the Lord's offerings. Um, but in New Testament, they were called the Feast of the Jews. Both, and both, off, or both the trespass and the unleavened bread were actually to, uh, put together. They were the same. All through the New Testament were the same. It wasn't, wasn't one day apart, but they were the same. They both began the same. It wasn't called no longer the Feast of the Lord. It was called the Feast of the Jews. And John chapter 2, verse 13 says the Jews passed over. And um, John chapter 5, verse 1 says the Feast of the Jews. And uh, John 6, 4 says in the Passover, uh, the Passover of Feast of the Jews was nigh. And even the last one that's mentioned, now there are seven there's seven uh, feasts of all, uh, all together, but we're only talking about for these three. And the last one that was mentioned of these three, uh, the Feast of the Tabernacles. The Bible says in John 7, 2, the Jews' Feast of the Tabernacles. Calling it the Jews' Feast, not God's Feast, but the Jews' Feast of the Tabernacle. Now, how does this, I mentioned last week about when Jesus was born, the surroundings of when Jesus was born, and and I was going to bring you into how does this all fit into this. Well, we know that in Luke chapter 2 that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. And uh, I want to turn into the New Testament. And we're going to be looking at some of these things and how does this fit in together and maybe help us understand some of, of the timing of these things. If you go to Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, now, I know you're familiar with these verses, and it's been preached to and taught on so many times. But there might be a few things you've never thought of, never came to your attention, and things I've never heard even spoke of myself. Uh, but um, in Luke chapter 2, that's where I want to begin with. Now, we're just going to kind of skip through a lot of stuff here. But uh, in the eighth day after his birth, Mary and Joseph went up to Jerusalem as you uh, can see in verses 21 and 22. Now, I'm not preaching on the birth of Christ. I'm preaching on the, the surroundings of it, how it all fit in time. Um, verses, where am I? Verse 21 and verse 22. It says, And the eighth day were accomplished for the circumcising of the child. And his name was called Jesus, which was uh, so uh, named by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her uh, purification, according to the law of Moses, going by, all this going back in the Old Testament and fulfilling the Old Testament, according to the law of, that were accomplished, uh, the law of Moses was accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him unto the Lord. So uh, they brought him to the Lord in verse 23, as it was written in the law of the Lord. Now, uh, they brought him to Jerusalem eight days after he was born in Bethlehem. So it's just one week and one day um, after he was born. And so they brought him to Bethlehem and uh, presented him. Uh, 
And uh, there are several reasons. And now, Bethlehem, by the way, uh, was only about six miles from uh, Jerusalem. It'd take a, roughly about an hour or less to walk it up to the temple. Now, they say that uh, if you're, it uh, depends where you're going. If you're going to the southern part of Jerusalem, you know, you know, the old Jerusalem was actually 10 miles south of the Jerusalem we know today. It ain't even same, it's not even the same spot. 10 miles difference. And so uh, if you get in the southern part of Jerusalem, uh, I mean uh, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, yeah, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, they say you can make it within 20 minutes walking. But uh, roughly about two hour walk, that's not that far, but uh, they could uh, walk uh, maybe less, it depends on how fast they go. And so uh, they walked through, uh, from uh, Bethlehem to Jerusalem. Now, from Nazareth to Bethlehem, as the crow flies or as a plane flies, is about 65 miles. Uh, but then there's two routes. There's two routes that from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. And uh, one route is about 70 miles, and it's a really rough retrain, retrain, what you would call it. Very rough, hard for a, a, a woman carrying a child to go. So there's another way that most scholars and, and uh, Bible believers and historians teach that they went, uh, they traveled with 90 miles, 90 miles. And so, and, but they traveled this uh, 90 miles to the city of uh, the ancestors of jo uh, Joseph, of Bethlehem, uh, they, of Judea, uh, Judea. Cause there's two Bethlehems. There's a Bethlehem that's not far from Nazareth, about 30 miles. So, uh, so, uh, just about 30 miles away. But that's not the Bethlehem was mentioned. In fact, the Bethlehem they went to was in the southern part, in Judea, and they traveled along uh, along the uh, along the uh, flatlands of Jordan, and they traveled. That way, and then went uh, west over the hills uh, surrounding Jerusalem, and then down into Bethlehem. Now, how long would it take to walk that? Well, there's there's different things that are said about it. Uh, from Nazareth to uh, Jerusalem, if you walked around eight to twelve miles, which is about average for most people, eight to twelve miles. Now, Jesus, being young and strong as he was, he was known to walk twenty miles in a day, easy. I mean. In fact, my son Daniel, when he went to uh, Jerusalem last year, or a year before, a couple years ago, uh, when he went there in the Holy Land, uh, he said he was so amazed how many miles Jesus could walk in a day. He got from this place to that place, and it'd be like 20 miles, and so uh, and he could walk in a day. But the average would be about 8 or 12 miles a day. In fact, uh, our uh, wagon train, usually didn't travel much faster than that, going out west to the California. And when they left St. Joe's, uh, Joe's, uh, uh, Joseph to uh, Cal California, and that, it took a good while. And that would take perhaps um, about four weeks, maybe a little longer, maybe a little less, about, but on the average about four weeks to, to travel. Now, if they traveled 20 miles a day and it could keep that up, it wouldn't take but four or five days to travel that far. And so they traveled about four weeks, and that's important to remember for what we're going to get to. I don't think we're going to get to it today at all. I'll we'll have to finish this next week. But um, they traveled from, uh, from uh, Nazareth to Jerusalem. Um, then after Jesus was born on the eighth day, they, to fulfill the law, they traveled from uh, from. Uh, Bethlehem, back up to uh, Jerusalem, about six miles north, up from them. And uh, verse 30, uh, 23 and verse uh, 39, uh, according to, they named the child. As, that was one reason. They would present him before the priest. They would name him before the witnesses. And then uh, have him uh, circumcised and uh, to offer uh, uh, their offerings as well on that uh, when they got there um in fact to paul mentioned in uh philippians chapter 3 verse 5 he, paul mentioned that he was circumcised on the eighth day and so on the eighth day would be as their circumcision for the young boy and um so um in verse 39 uh 
Go to verse 39. Let's flip over to that verse 39. Verse 39, it says, And when they had performed all things according to the law. So they did all these things according to what the Bible says, what God says, what the Old Testament says, what was written in Moses, by Moses and others. Uh, performed all these things. The Bible says they returned to Na uh, returned into Galilee to their own city Nazareth. So they left Jerusalem. They went to they went from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. Eight days after Jesus was born, they left from Jerusalem to Nazareth, another ninety miles north to their homes four or so weeks travel now there are a lot of people who will teach and and I've read in a number of books that uh, Jesus was born or might have been born at the time of the Passover and the love and love and bread that would be an impossible according to this they would never got back in time for the next feast if it was the Passover. They did not. If you notice of what they bring, um, they brought um, two turtle doves in verse uh, 25, 24. Um, their sacrifice was a pair of turtle, two turtle doves and two young, or two young pigeons. That was a poor man's uh, uh, sacrifice that was given. There was no lamb brought for the Passover. There were no fruit bought, brought for the uh, for the harvest time, for uh, Pentecost day. There was no fruit brought, nothing brought. brought. They, they carried none of these things. They went right back home, and they could not got back in time for these feasts if he was born at that time. They couldn't have got back in time. And so, because they left eight days after, or eight or nine, maybe they maybe stayed overnight in Jerusalem before they left, but they left within eight or nine days after Jesus was born back home. We'll see more about this next week. Father, we thank the Lord for the word of God, and I pray you'll bless us and help us to understand these things and how this all ties into um, the Old Testament and all the fulfillment of the law.